Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. So I want to focus tonight on the kingdom responds to change and crisis. <clears throat> Write that down. The kingdom responds to what? Change and crisis. Have you ever gone out in the morning and the weather was beautiful and you were out about your life and suddenly everything became dark at 3 o'clock and there was a thunderstorm. And then the rain came at 3.30. And it was raining cats and dogs. What did you do? You continued what you were doing, didn't you? But you had to adjust some things, didn't you? You had to turn the wipers on in the car. You had to cover your head to run from the car to the store or wherever you were going or to your job. You had to drive slower because of the rain. You had to be more careful about the other drivers and people standing on the streets, being careful not to hurt them or wet them with the water. And you even were delayed in your arrival to places because of the weather. Some of your appointments had to be canceled, maybe, because you couldn't get there in time anymore, because the rain may have been so heavy that it caused traffic jams and you missed an appointment. Uh, uh, and what you didn't do at the end of the day is you didn't commit suicide because of that. What you do when things change, you adjust. This is a very important session. The kingdom, how does it respond to change and crisis? I want to focus in this segment on kingdom keys to thriving in times of crisis. Thriving in times of crisis. The kingdom of God is not a religion. Jesus Christ was never a religious man. His message was not a religious message. As a matter of fact, his number one opposition were not sinners. The record shows that his number one opposition were religious people. It was they who attacked him. It was they who schemed to kill him. It was they who tried to trap him in his own words many times. It was they who accused him of being full of a devil. The sinners loved him. The Bible called him, the, he was called a friend of sinners. This is a paradox. The reason why he was so antagonistically approached by religious people is because they expected the Messiah to be a religious person. But his message was about a kingdom. I know what a kingdom is. I was born in one in 1954. I lived in a kingdom up to 1973. And I lived under the a jurisdiction influence of a king and a queen. My islands that I was born in and still live in today were under a kingdom for over 200 years. And so we have the culture of kingdom in our blood. So when I read the Bible, the Bible makes sense to me. If you were born in a democracy all your life, as you have in this country, for over 200 years now, you actually are a product of rebellion against the kingdom in 1776. So there was no opportunity for this great country to have any concept of kingdoms in its culture. So when I read the Bible, I understand the words of Jesus perhaps a little bit more succinctly and clearly than those who were born in a democratic culture. 
Christ came preaching a kingdom. A kingdom is not a religion. A kingdom is, write this down, a country. Jesus came to earth to reintroduce a country. This is the problem with religion today. Religion is still propagating and promoting a religion concept and not a country concept. A religion cannot survive crisis. You know, Jesus Christ, his first public statement is made in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Make a note. He says these words. It says, and from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. Quote, repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has arrived, he says. Is at hand simply means in the old British New King James Version has arrived. He was announcing not the coming, but the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. He couldn't just say the kingdom, because a kingdom is a country. So he had to say the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is the place. Heaven, and please forgive my feeble human term, is a country. It's an invisible country. It is more real than earth. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that the unseen is more real than the seen. Heaven is an invisible country that produced planet earth. The entire physical universe is a product of heaven, created by the king of heaven for the purpose of extending the influence of heaven. The first kingdom that ever existed then is the kingdom of heaven. It's the original kingdom. That is where man got the idea of kingdom from. From the DNA of Adam, it was built into his chromosomes that somewhere in the blood system of Adam's cells was the concept of kingdom. When God called Moses at the burning bush, some of you may not even recall the details, but God told Moses, go and get the people out of Egypt for me. Why? Because I want to make them a royal priesthood, not a religious priesthood. But a royal priest. Royalty is kingship. A royal priesthood and a holy nation, not a religion. That's all he wants. When God spoke to Abraham, some of you missed the details. God was not creating Judaism. Let's quote again what God told Abraham. Sometimes we are so busy being religious, we miss the entire mandate. Because Abraham, I will bless you. And I will make you a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Those who come against verbally what I'm telling you. He says, and I will bless you. Now watch him. He says, ultimately, my goal is, and through you. In other words, I'm only using you. We've made Abraham more important than Jesus. And through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. What's he after? Nation again. He wants to bless nations, not individuals only. The purpose for blessing an individual is for national impact. I will bless you so I can bless the nations. 
one of our problems is we pray for our own prosperity and not the prosperity of the whole community. Amen. Hmm. In our own ministry this year, our focus is on kingdom community. And the Lord was very clear to me. He said, I want you to go and preach around the world all year. One message. Building a kingdom community. I am not a God of individual success. Individualism is an invention of capitalism. You are not supposed to even approach God for yourself. Oh, it gets deep now. They asked Jesus, how should we pray? He said, when you pray, follow this pattern. You begin like this. Not my father. Are y'all quiet for a reason over here or something? He said, don't even come to me with your own needs. Come with everybody's needs. Our father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom influence come. Thy culture be done where? On earth as is in heaven. Give us, not me. Forgive us. Lead us not. What's your problem? See, we've made the American dream God's dream. And it's not God's dream. That's why the system is falling apart. Because the whole system is built on individual success. So a few CEOs could destroy the system. Capitalism to me, and I did my studies in college, my conclusion is it's a system that capitalizes on the weak. And this is why a few CEOs could fly away with a bonus and your cousin is left with a house in the bank. Community, everybody say community. community. Tell your neighbor your success is my concern. The Bible says if one of us laugh and rejoice, all should rejoice. And if one of us weep, all should weep. It's a different concept. Hmm. God's changing everything. So Jesus brought this beautiful concept of a country to earth, the kingdom of heaven. And he began to teach that in every page. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The message of Jesus. It's the kingdom has arrived. That kingdom is here right now. But we are still victims of the other kingdom. Because we have mixed religion into the concept. And have become victims of our own religion. Religion is man's search for God. The kingdom is what man's searching for. And when he finds the kingdom, he stops searching. So if you're not satisfied yet as a believer, a Christian, that means you've not yet found the kingdom. One time Christ said it this way. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who was digging in the field, just working, and he hit something. And when he dug it up, he found it was treasure. He covered it back up, he looked this way and that way, and he went away and sold everything he had. Car, house, land, cat, dog, and CD player. <laughs> Came back and bought that one parcel of ground. Why? He had found everything he was trying to accumulate in one hole. He said, such is the kingdom of heaven. When you find it, you stop searching. And this is why perhaps Christianity is still not satisfying to many people. 
because it has been reduced to a religion. And man did not lose a religion. He lost a country, a kingdom. This is why our number one pursuit in life, write this down, is government. I know you don't want to admit that, but I'm telling you, that's your priority. Think about it for a minute. Everybody in this room either support or criticize government. And we usually blame everything that's happening to us on government. We also believe that if we want to improve it, we got to change government. And if something goes wrong, we always make the responsible party the government. And this is why we spend billions of dollars around the world every year changing governments. Do you know why? That is what you lost. And that's what Jesus bought. Isaiah 9 verse uh oh, verse 7 says, For unto you a child will be born, and unto you a son will be given, and he's coming with the government upon his shoulders. Next verse says, and of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And he will reign on a throne, not a podium, not a pulpit, a throne. What do you do with these verses? This is why Jesus never spoke in the trial before the religious leaders. It was the wrong courtroom. You don't try a, a politician in a religious court. He was a king. And the Bible said they examined him and questioned. He answered not a word. Why? Wrong courtroom. I'm a king. I'm not a religious leader. And then the Bible said they took him before Pilate. He said, all right, now I can talk. And Pilate says, do you know I have the power from my kingdom to take your life or give it to you? And Christ got excited. Christ said, Pilate, you could have no authority over me except it was first given to you by my government in heaven. For even now, I could call ten legions of my own soldiers, angels, and they would deliver me out of your hands. But because I came here to use you to get me killed, shut your mouth and get me crucified. So that's what I came here to do. Pilate says, yes, sir, what is truth? He didn't bring a religion. He bought a kingdom. What is a kingdom? It's a country. Write the word country down. Just write it down, country. If you didn't bring any note paper, find Malachi. And between Malachi and Matthew in your Bible, there's a blank page. <laughs> so take note, right there. I'm serious, it is there, brother. Look for it, it's there. What is a country? A country is a nation. Write the word nation next to it. And that's what Jesus Christ is interested in. Nation. What is a nation? I'll give you a list of what a nation is. Write them down. Number one, territory. Territory. Nation must have territory. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is the territory. Earth is also heaven's colony. It's an extended territory. Two, language. Nations must have one language. This is why you speak in tongues. Tongues is not a religious experience. It is a national experience. A nation is known by its language. Number three, constitution. All nations have a constitution. The book in your lap is not a religious book. It is called a law book, isn't it? It's the law of God. It's a constitutional book. We make it religious. A constitution provides rights and privileges to citizens. 
not devotions. We use the Bible for devotions instead of learning our rights and our privileges. <laughs> Number four, law. All nations have laws. Law protects the people and the constitution. That's why you must have law. As a matter of fact, law is probably the most important component in a nation. Because law is the manifestation of the, the constitutional commitment of the people to live by standards that protect their constitution. This is why the first thing God gave the children of Israel was not power. He was going to build a nation. The first thing he gave them was what? Law. Because law produces culture. That's the next one. All nations have culture. That's what Jesus brought to earth. Number six. All nations have code of ethics. You cannot live in a country without a code of ethic. We call it morality, ethical behavior, norms. All nations must have a code of ethics. Number seven, all nations have values. Values. We call them ideals. The kingdom of God is no different. It has values. Values are simply the things that a nation value. For example, in America, you value freedom. Most countries around you don't. You think they do. For example, in Japanese, there's no word for freedom. So the kamikaze pilots were trying to figure out, what are you all fighting for? So they bombed their planes into your ships. You talking about you fighting for freedom. They said, what is freedom? And then they bombed the ship with their own lives. Now the Eastern nations got the same problem. There's no word in their language in Arabic for freedom. So when your president says, we want you to be free, there's not even a word in the language for it. So your ideal may not be their ideal. Go do your research on it. Check it out. And this is why even in leadership, you've got to be knowledgeable before you start doing diplomacy. Because your language may be a foreign language to people. For example, nations in, in the Asian countries and the Arabic countries, they value honor, not freedom. Honor is more important than freedom. This is why they would have laws which say, you know, if you disgrace the family, we will kill you. Uh, they, why? You have disgraced the honor of the family. So they, they have a different value system. And you and I can't understand that. Why would you kill your own daughter? And you're saying, this is crazy. But it's their values that control them. When you study the kingdom of God, the values are different. For example, in the kingdom of God, God values love more than revenge. So he says, love your enemy. That doesn't make any sense to you. If somebody just robbed you and raped your wife, God says, love them. What? No, you kill them. He said, no, in my country, you forgive them. See, look at your face. It's tough. For example, how about value, valuing Money. In the kingdom of God, God doesn't value money. In, in your culture, it's a big value. You work for it 24 hours a day. In the kingdom of God, you walk on it. The streets are made out of gold. You work for it, God walks on it. See, two different values. That's why the Bible says, why do you worry about what you will eat and drink? You guys, your value system is screwed up, he says. Seek first. That's, that's, that's what you put value on the kingdom first. You put value on food first. Two different countries. That's why the first word Jesus used is repent. Write the word repent down. Word repent means to change your thinking. You cannot live in the kingdom of God with a religious mind. 
It's a country. Values. Number nine, all countries have customs. Customs. The kingdom of God has customs. Just like America and Canada and England, oh, you want to get customs. All countries have customs. In other words, things that are customary to the culture. It's your custom to play baseball. In the kingdom of God, it's the custom to have communion. It's a country. People have no idea why you take communion. Who are not a part of the kingdom of God. They don't say, well, why you all do that? It's our custom. We remember our king's death for us. It's a country. Now, uh, can I give you one more? Yeah. By the way, there are 26 of these. I won't give them to you. Got to buy the book out there called <laughs> Rediscovering the Kingdom. In the back of it, I give you 26 specific components of a country and a kingdom. Go and buy the book. Because nothing is yours until you learn it. A good teacher never gives the answers. They stimulate an interest in them. So the student could pursue them himself. All countries have a judicial system. Judicial system. In other words, judgment mechanics. There is in every country a place to deal with those who violate law. The kingdom of God is a country. It deals with judgment. So when you violate the laws of a country, you come before the judicial system, and then they hand out penalties. The kingdom of God is no different. And I think what we have failed to do, I'm saying this very important, listen to me carefully, this is what our problem is for the last 1900 years. We lost it almost 1900 years ago. And that is a respect for law. We have actually replaced law with grace. Kingdoms do not function on grace. They function on law. Countries cannot function on grace. Grace, write this down, grace is extended opportunity to keep the law again. I'm going to say it again. Grace is extended privilege or opportunity to start keeping the law again. Grace is not given for you to violate law, but to continue keeping it. That's why the charismatic movement is such a, an embarrassing mess, because there is no law in this 21st century church. We sin because we know we could get forgiveness. That's not a country, that's chaos. We plan our forgiveness before we sin. Because we have made grace more important than law. Grace is never more important than law. Grace brings you back in position to keep the law. That's why when the woman was caught in adultery, according to what the people said, Christ said something very important to her. He said, first of all, I do not condemn you. In other words, I'm the king. I can judge you now. I forgive you. Fine. He said, but now the next thing is important. Go and sin no more. In other words, I'm letting you go so you could keep the law. Huh? Think country. Everybody says, think, think country. If you, if, if you think nation and country, you'll read the Bible correctly. So countries must judge. This is why when the Bible says that when you delay justice, you increase corruption. Because if you don't judge in a country, 
you are a part of the corruption. So in the body of Christ, if a man who is in position in church and leadership messes up his life, the constitution is very clear on what to do with that man. And none of the pastors today seem to want to obey the law. The law says, first of all, approach that man directly. Tell him about his fault and his sin. And then it says, you must judge, you must sit down. And if he, refu if he refuses to hear you, it says, then take him to the whole council. And if he refuses to hear them, take him to the whole church. And if he refuses to hear them, it says, put him out. When was the last time you put an evangelist out of the church? People get divorced on Monday and they keep preaching on Tuesday. What kind of foolish church is this? There's no government. No judgment. That's why there's no fear in the church. Tell me how you feel, brother. Tell me how you feel when you watch Mr. Ted Hyde get on Larry King. Oh. Embarrassing the whole church. Because no one will confront him and say, brother, shut your mouth for five years, become a member of the church and sit on the front row and start over again. No, we don't want to do that, see? You know, it's amazing. In America, in your own nation, when someone breaks the law, what do you do? You remove them from the society and put them in a place called prison. Same thing God says, remove them. He says, if they don't want to align up with the law, you remove them out of the society, out of the community. Because one act affects the community. Am I right? Tell your neighbor, live right for my sake. Boy, what a statement to make for the rest of your life. That's how you live. The kingdom of God is a country. And if you violate the law, you are compromising everybody. So you must, you must all be responsible for helping others to keep the law. Say, hey, brother, no, I, I saw you at that club last night. You can't do that, man. You're in the choir, man. You can't be in the club and be in the choir, brother. You're going to mess up all. In other words, you deal with it yourself right there. You don't gossip about it, you talk to him. Say, brother, I can't let you do this to us. Either you're in the choir or you're in the club. Now, which one are you in, brother? Because we got to make a decision. I'm going to tell the whole church where I saw you if you don't clean your act up. That's law. Go ahead and clap your hands. Praise God. We like grace because it allows us to sin. <laughs> Got to get back to it. I remember a rich young man came to Jesus and asked Christ the ultimate question. What is the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your neighbor as yourself. The next day, another young man came to Jesus and asked him a question. What must I do to inherit the kingdom? That was the question. Christ says, keep the law. Now, I never heard a preacher preach on that yet. He didn't say, believe in me and thou shalt be saved. He says, keep the law and you enter the kingdom. Yeah, I know. You see, you never heard that before. See, they, they tell you, well, you just pray. No, he says, keep the law. And then the man says, okay, what are the law? And Christ began to repeat the Ten Commandments again in the New Testament. His first public statement, repent. For the government of heaven has arrived. Second statement. I didn't come to destroy the law. Uh oh. Uh oh. But to enforce it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
You don't need grace for that. That's law. <laughs> Sleep only with your wife. And you only with your husband. That's, that's kingdom living. Getting quiet now. See, all of a sudden it's quiet. See? Because you love Christianity. It allows you to sin and still sing in the choir. <laughs> Policemen are driving all over the city tonight, watching for what? Lawbreakers. We need, we need to have some saints. Just moving around the kingdom all the time. Looking for who? Lawbreakers. <laughs> Aren't you married? Yeah. Well, what are you doing here with this guy? <laughs> the kingdom of God is a country. Say it. The kingdom of God is a country. Yeah. Now, the kingdoms of the world are countries. I want to talk about this. Write this down. The countries of the world are in crisis. They are in crisis. Oh, by the way, let me give you number, is that, was that number nine? Let me give you number 11. Taxes. All kingdoms have taxes. And number 12, all kingdoms have economies. Economies, all kingdoms. That's why tithing is a command from God. It is a tax. That's why giving is a command from God. It's the economic system of heaven. The economic system of heaven is built on giving, not receiving as the priority, but giving. It's a different culture. In the kingdom of God, giving is the culture of the economy. In the world, Taking is the culture. You take what you can. So five CEOs decide that they are going to maximize the mortgage system so they can get more money. And so they take. They take. The Bible calls it greed. Greed is the abuse of resources for personal gain. In the kingdom, we give. Greed is the abuse of resources for personal gain. In the kingdom of God, you give for the benefit of everybody else. That's why the Bible says, listen carefully, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom culture. Why? Because he got his wealth probably by taking and now when he enters this new country, you live by giving it away. And this is why it is not impossible. He said it's hard. Hmm? Do you remember there was a guy who was a professional white collar thief? His name was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was in the system. He was a merchant and a tax collector. The guy was serious. And you remember what Jesus did to him? He went to his house. Now in those days, uh, everybody say thresh. thresh. Say threshold. threshold. What is that? That's the wood across the door. It's an important wood, piece of wood. In the eastern countries, that piece of wood is called a barrier. That's why it's called a thresh, a barrier. You don't let anybody cross that barrier lightly because once they cross that thresh, they become one with your house. <laughs> so Jesus, when he said to Zacchaeus, today, this is a very powerful statement, 
Now everyone, the town is packed with people. They know Jesus. They know this guy is a powerful miracle worker. He's a holy man. There's no guile in him. He is a pure man. And this guy is telling a thief, today I want to cross your thresh. I want to become one with your house. I want to eat with you in your house. And this is why when he went in, the Pharisees and scribes lost it. Remember? They said, your master, how can he eat? How can he enter the house of a publican and a sinner? They couldn't believe he became one. The kingdom of God is never intimidated by the culture of the world. Can I say it again? Yes. The kingdom of God is never intimidated by the culture of the world. You're never afraid of their culture. You can walk right into their territory. Why? Because you are the dominant culture. You don't believe me? Watch what happens next. He comes in the house, he sits at the table, and eats Zacchaeus' food. Now, when anyone eats your food in that culture, they've eaten your sweat. Anyone from the eastern country will tell you that. In other words, a man's bread is his life. When he shares his bread with you, he's shared his entire life with you. So when the Bible said Christ ate at the house, he was eating Zacchaeus' life. And when the meal was over, this rich man, who was a capitalist, suddenly went through a transformation, repentance, his thinking changed. And what happens? A taker suddenly became a giver without anyone prodding him. That is happening to you right now while I'm teaching. You need to stop being a religious person and start becoming a kingdom person. And you prove your kingdom power by your capacity to let things go. I dare you. And Zacchaeus began to give everything back. And he got so excited, he told Jesus. He said, look, master, look. See, I am giving every man back what I took from him and even more. What a transformation. When a stingy man becomes a giver, that's a miracle. <laughs> Give God a hand for a miracle, kingdom miracle. <laughs> 2009 is the clash of kingdoms. That's why the system is falling apart. Number two, change is the human equalizer. Everybody in this room is being affected by change right now, whether you like it or not. Some of you older folks, you thought you retired. Now your retirement is gone. Your 401k is gone. Some of you thought you had a permanent job, now your job is in jeopardy, or you probably lost it. Some of you thought that your business was gonna be intact for years, and now your business can't even get a loan from the bank to continue. Everything is changing. It equalizes everybody. Write this down, number three. Crisis is simply unexpected change. That's why they're calling it a crisis. What is a crisis? I can't hear you. What is a crisis? Hey, boy, say it together louder. Unexpected change. What's a crisis? Unexpected change. Very important. So any change that you didn't expect becomes a crisis. The country didn't expect this to happen. Three years ago, we were booming. Last year, oil prices knocked everything out of whack. This year now, the whole system is collapsing. Unexpected change. What is unexpected change? Crisis. Crisis. Let's talk a little bit about change and crisis. Let's see if you have a few in your own life. Write these down, number one. Here's what I call different changes that bring crisis. All challenge and change in our life is a crisis. All change is a crisis. 
Case in point, you used to weigh 110, remember? <laughs> don't, don't laugh at that. She's, re she's remembering good old days, yes. Your stomach used to be in your chest, remember, brother? Yeah. Come on, guys, say amen right there. Amen. Your stomach dropped, right? And now it's out here. Yeah. It's a change. That's a crisis. You can't put that pants on anymore. Some of you ladies go to the closet and you have depression. Am I right? Your best dress. All you can do is look at it now. Lord, I used to love that dress. Come on, guys. Don't think you got away. Remember that suit, that one you really like? Yo, you, you know, men are real cool. The men say, this belt is tight. Your wife said, no, buy a bigger size. It's a crisis. Number two, crisis is a result of change. I want you to take the fear out of crisis tonight. Number three, some crises are self-imposed. For example, you've been smoking cigarettes for 40 years and now you get lung cancer. The cancer is a crisis, but you impose it on yourself. You've been drinking alcohol for the last 20 years. Now your liver is completely consumed by the alcohol. And the doctor says you have to have an operation. It's a crisis. You imposed it. You did not manage your marriage properly for the last 20 years. You were so busy doing your work, you neglected your wife. And now your marriage is in trouble and you got a divorce on your hand. That's a crisis. But it was self-imposed because you'd mismanaged your life. Some crises are self-imposed. Number three, write this down. An external crisis is a result of changes over which you have no control. And that's what's happening to us right now. As a matter of fact, number five is even more graphic. The greatest result of crisis is change. And I want to focus on this the next two days. Change and crisis. I'm going to show you how the kingdom overcomes change and crisis. When I'm finished with this next two days, you will have no fear of next year. You're going to be able to walk into every day with confidence. As a matter of fact, when we finish this, this seminar on the last next four days, we're going to give you equipment, tools, to be in control of every day. Okay. Remember now, crisis is when you are out of control. That's what makes it a crisis. The kingdom of God puts you in control. And we're going to see how that happens. So number six, mastering the change of crisis is determined by your ability to manage and benefit from change. Lord have mercy. What's the key to life? Managing and benefiting from change. Your life right now is a result of how you handle changes in your life. Let me say it again. What you are right now is a result of how you handle the changes that took place in your life. Some of you are not doing good. Why? Because you didn't manage the changes properly. Some of you are doing fine. Why? You manage the changes properly. Change is inevitable. So get used to it. And success on earth is your capacity to manage it and benefit from it. That's the key. A crisis is only possible when you are overwhelmed by the change. 500,000 jobs were lost in the last three months. They anticipate five million will be lost by the end of the year. 15 banks already collapsed as of last Monday. They anticipate more banks collapsing to the point where the government is thinking about buying the banks. What does that change mean to you as a kingdom citizen? Now remember, you are in the world, but not of the world. So we got to learn, how do I handle that change? Yes. And benefit from it. Don't miss a session, please. Go to work and tell your boss you got a doctor's appointment. Miles Monroe, Dr. Miles Monroe. Be here in the morning, tomorrow afternoon. Make sure you're here. Why? Because I'm going to show you that 
the very job you are going to to stay away from the session could not be there next month. Knowledge is more important than expediency. Tell your neighbor, we're going to benefit from change. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to master crisis. Here was, what is a crisis? You've been hearing it all this year. Crisis, crisis. What's a crisis? Write this down. Let me define it for you. A crisis is, write this down, an event, a circumstance, or a situation affecting you or your environment over which you have no direct cause, control, or responsibility. That's a crisis. What is a crisis? It is an event or a circumstance or a situation like the economic conditions right now over which you have no direct cause. You didn't cause it. You can't control it and you can't take responsibility for it. But you are in it. That's a crisis. You can spend your life getting angry and cursing everybody and getting depressed, put a gun to your head and cancel your life. Or you can look at this and say, look, let me get control of this. Don't miss tomorrow. Let me give you a little preview. Jesus said these words. In this world, you will have many troubles. Watch him now. You will have many. It's a promise. He promised trouble. See, the problem with the charismatic movement is they only want the ones for the blessing promises. In this world, you will have many troubles. He says, but have no fear. Why? I have overcome the world, and you will overcome. Give God a praise. Yeah. He didn't say you overcome it by leaving it. What I'm going to teach you in this brief series is how he overcame it. I'm going to show you his secrets, and I'm using them. I have total peace. And I'm debt free in Jesus' name. Shh, hang on. And that wasn't because I prayed. That's because I applied kingdom principles every day. And that's why I was sent here. Okay, write this down. Crisis is unplanned and uncontrolled change. Say that with me. Crisis is unplanned and uncontrolled change. What is a crisis? Unplanned and uncontrolled. In other words, you didn't plan on this thing happening, but it happened. You can't control this thing, but it has happened. This change has hit your life, and you didn't cause it, you didn't plan on it, and it's a part of your experience. You can't control it. That's a crisis. Some of you are still not clear on what it is, so let me break it down for you, okay? Let's talk about the changes that bring crisis. If, if, if you find yourself in this, just shout amen. Number one, the loss of a job. Amen. Come on, say it loud and don't be ashamed because you can get your job back when I'm finished with you. Amen. Create your own job. Number two, another crisis, death of a child. Amen. You didn't plan for this baby to die. Another crisis, death of a spouse. You plan to live under your old age and die together. But things happen. It's a crisis. How about this one? Collapse of your business. You were doing well five years ago, and now you can't even get a loan from the bank to keep payroll. That's a crisis. Your 401k, you had it all worked out. Now they're wondering if they could even find the money to pay you Hallelujah. what they lost. And the company that was matching it is gone. What do you do? Business collapse. 
How about this crisis? A terminal disease. You thought you was healthy until you went for a checkup. It's a crisis. How about this one? A divorce. You remember at that altar when you said, until death do us part. And then it was until the last argument. You didn't plan on that. That's a crisis. And you couldn't control it. You couldn't stop the person from making a decision. It's a crisis. How about this one? Loss of a home. You worked so hard for this home. You paid your mortgage. You worked all these years. You built this thing. And now it's repossessed. That's a crisis. You didn't plan on that. Can't control it. How about this one? An unmarried pregnant daughter. And you happen to be the pastor. Man. Or the choir leader or the youth director. And your daughter is pregnant. And you've been teaching stuff. And now your own family has fallen apart. That's a crisis. You didn't plan on that. How do you manage that? Another crisis. A drug addict child. You taught your kids to love God. You took them to Sunday school. You were such a nice parent. And now your son is on drugs. Your daughter is on drugs. You're like, how can this happen to me? That's a crisis. You didn't plan on that. How about this crisis? A homosexual child. I taught my kids. You, I taught you how to live. I taught you God's laws. What do you mean this is your lifestyle? It's a crisis in the house. The death of a parent. It's a tough one. Because you love your parents. Sometimes you just think they ain't never supposed to die. They are always supposed to be right there. And then they're gone. It's a crisis. We've all been touched by some of these. You can't control them. They weren't planned. Just like the economic situation today. All right. The effects of crisis, real quickly. Fear. Trauma. Depression. Despair. Frustration. Anxiety. Loneliness. Abandonment. Worry, hopelessness, sense of loss, sense of death, sense of survival. I got to make it somehow. Crisis brings abuse. That's when you abuse the folks you love the, best, the most under pressure. You begin to blame your wife or blame your husband for what's going on. When in fact it's not their fault. But you turn on them because you feel the stress. You abuse one another. And then of course you get crime always elevates under pressure and crisis. People begin to feel desperate and they break into homes, they rob banks, they, they hold people up at, at stores and, and this is the, the crime rate goes up under crisis. And then of course we have domestic violence where a husband or wife would blame each other and the stress and the tension would cause nerves to be on edge and people hurt one another in the house. That list is what's going on right now in American society and in my country, and in all the countries of Europe, that same list. That's why you have to take charge of your life. That will be your future in the next two months if you don't take charge of crisis. I came here not to give you a good word. I came to give you some answers to your present condition. There's no time to be shouting hallelujah. We need some instructions from God. How do we handle when I lose my house, lose my job, abandon my family? What do I do when my business ain't working and my church offering ain't coming in? What do I do? You know what to do. How do you overcome the world? Well, here's some positive aspects of crisis. Take a deep breath. Say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, because number one, unity. Crisis drives people together. Number two, community. Crisis destroys individuality and cultivates dependency again. That's why you got to go back to people who you abandoned. 
Some of you got to go back even to your parents' house to live now. Didn't speak to them for years. Now you lost yours. It creates community. You were such a high hog in church and you thought you was doing fine. Now your business collapsed and now you got to depend on the handouts of the church hospitality group. Brings back community. Number three, empathy. Crisis suddenly makes you sympathize with other people because now you ain't got nothing to. See, sometimes we forget what it feels like to have nothing. That's why Paul says, whether I'm a base or whether I am a full, I am the same because God will supply no matter what. If I have or don't have, he says, my life is the same. I learn how to be a based. Sometimes we forget what it feels like to have nothing. And God would allow a crisis to reduce you to empathy. Crisis is also the source of solidarity. You ever heard this? If we don't live together, we'll sink apart. It brings us back together. Fourth, crisis produces hum hum humanity. It makes us humans again. You used to drive past, never speak to your neighbor. Now you're losing your house. And so is your neighbor. And the sign is outside on the, on the lawn and both of your houses. You can talk to each other all of a sudden. You too? Yeah, man, me too. Well, boy, listen, I didn't realize you. Yeah, I didn't know you was doing that bad too, man. You got it bad. You got it bad. Yeah, you got it bad too. And all of a sudden you begin to realize we're all humans. Crisis will bring you back together. Crisis also produces simplicity. It makes life simple again. All you want is a meal now. You don't need five cars in the garage no more. Sell them and become liquid. You need cash now. We don't, we don't, you're not going to have no pride anymore. I got ten cars. You want something to eat. Give God a hand for simplicity. Come on, clap your hands. Praise God. Crisis will bring you back to a simple life. Yeah. That's a good part of crisis. Number seven, spirituality. They say that churches attendance have escalated in Europe. I was in England not too long ago and the front page story in the Telegraph was church attendance is up in the Anglican church. Lord have mercy. Why? Because when people are stressed and anxious and afraid, they turn back to God. Some of you came here to this conference because you're nervous. Your 401k is three, just gone. 401k, 401k, as you call it, it's gone. Your house is on, 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 on the block. And you go, I, I, I need God. Friendships. Crisis restores friendships. People you never spoke to for years. All of a sudden you call them up. How you doing? You, you really want some money. Start making friends again. Why? We lost contact with each other. And crisis brings us back together. I just remember, you know, Jerry owns that place down there. Maybe we can get a loan from him. He, he works in the bank. All of a sudden, we become friends with Jerry again. Crisis will bring you back to friendships. Number nine. Crisis brings you back to the common good. You begin to do what's good for the whole community. Number ten. Crisis reprioritizes your life. All of a sudden, the things you thought were important are not important anymore. So you start unloading things. You got two boats. You don't need two boats no more. You need to find some food. Matter of fact, you don't need no boat at all. You need a house. You got to keep your house. So you sell your boat now to keep the house. You, pre you, pre you reprioritize. Crisis does wonderful things. As a matter of fact, the last one I have here. These last two. Crisis returns you to the simple life. A pillow, a plate, and a bed. Brings you back down to earth. And number 12. You return to fundamental values. God, family, love. I need family. When you ain't got nothing, you need family. 
And that's what God's bringing all of us back to. That's why you shouldn't curse this crisis. It could be a divine strategy to bring all the high-minded people in the world back to their knees. Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going to show you where God specifically says he creates crisis. I'll show you that in the Bible. Don't miss it tomorrow. All right, let me give you a couple more thoughts before we go. When there's a crisis, the only first mark of defense you have is thought. Write this down. It's the secret of Jesus. You are always in control of your thoughts, your mentality. You can't control the hurricane. You can't control the thunderstorm. You can't control the economic conditions, but you could control how you think about them. Imagine your first line of defense is you can control how you think about them, which means suddenly they're no longer in control. You can control your thoughts. You can control your mind. And the last one, you can control your perception. Write that down. Your interpretation of what's happening. The secret to living in the kingdom of God is seeing life differently from the world sees it. Your perception, how you interpret things. For example, only God can look at a fiery furnace and see it as a blessing. That's right. <laughs> Do you know that the, the, the so-called charismatic faith could not survive the test of Scripture? Guaranteed. Because the modern charismatic faith is only built for blessings, not for trials. That's why the folks fall off, they fall off so quickly. One problem, you don't see them anymore in church, they're gone. Why? Because you've been preaching one side of the message. Thank you. Kingdom faith is not a faith just for good times. Oh, I'm getting ready to preach before I go now. Kingdom faith is faith that is solid in the hard times. Come on, somebody. Kingdom faith doesn't just say, the Lord will deliver me, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. That's one side of it. The other side is, but even if he doesn't, that's the kind of faith we're missing. Where's your faith when you lose your house? Who tell you God won't let you? God will allow you to lose your house. That ain't the devil, that's God. Don't just blame the devil. Could you imagine Shadrach said to Meshach, God ain't putting the fire out. <laughs> Abednego said, yes, sir, I guess we ain't praying. Maybe, maybe there's sin in our lives. Maybe we ain't praying. Maybe, maybe, we haven't, maybe, maybe we ain't got no faith. You got faith and you're praying good. But this time you're going in the fire, God says. Can you handle faith in the fire? Do you still believe God if they repossess your house? That's the question. You lose your job. Do you still believe God is with you in the fire? Do you have lion's den faith? Hey boy, say crisis faith. The kingdom has crisis faith. We're not afraid of hard times. You shall have many troubles. But I've overcome. So be not afraid. Because greater is he. Come on, all this stuff you confess and now we're going to see if you can test it. Can you give God praise with nothing? It's kingdom faith. We have in very strange ways misinterpreted Job and almost made Job guilty of being a man of God. Job got more faith than 90% of us in this room. Even though he slay me. Even though I lost my job. Even though my business failed last month. Even though my whole car was 
repossessed, repossessed. And my house is gone. Uh, even though yet I'll trust him. What kind of faith do you have? Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Can I repeat it again? Yes. Write it down. I have a new book coming out on this very subject. The power of kingdom faith. We've lost it. Faith, your faith is only as strong as the tests it survives. Crisis don't come to destroy faith. They come to expose the lack of it. It's what you came through, daughter, that makes you great. Not what you avoided. I respect you because you're still standing. How do you see? Write this down. Whatever you call or label a thing, that is what it becomes to you. This is good stuff. Did you hear what I said? Whatever you, what? Call or label a thing, that is what it is to you. That's why in the kingdom of God, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Because sight will let you label it what you see. Number two, whatever a thing is to you controls your response to it. Oh, oh my God. Oh, the whole thing's falling apart. Oh, oh, economic. Oh, oh, chaos. Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. We, America's dying. Oh, the world is collapsing. Oh, but whatever you see it as controls your response. Number three, controlled perception is not denial of reality. That's important. But it is the control of your response to reality. We don't say that the storm isn't coming. We don't walk around like the Christian scientists and say, you know, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. No, you are sick. That's the reality. But you got to interpret that properly. Paul would say, that sickness is not unto death. Christ would say, that sickness is not unto death. What do they mean? Yeah, you're sick. But we see something else. God's using this. Can God use a fiery furnace? Yeah, to expose the fourth man. You would have never known there was a fourth man if there was not a fiery furnace. I wonder what he's going to use this crisis for to show what kind of person he is as God in your life. Hallelujah. You don't walk around saying, my, my baby didn't die. Your baby did die. I didn't get a divorce. You did get a divorce. That's the reality. My husband did die. My wife did die. That's the reality. Now you got to control your response to it. And that comes from getting the mind and the perception of God about crisis. Crisis doesn't come to destroy. It comes to bring faith. Matter of fact, write this down. Crisis is simply a change in the environment that demands a new unscheduled response. That's a good step. In other words, you didn't plan on this happening. So now you got to respond in a way you never planned to respond. That's what crisis does. It tests your capacity to land on your feet. Some through the water, some through the flood. 
some through great sorrows, all through the blood. Are you coming through? It's a test of kingdom faith. Crisis. You are strong people. God ain't got no sissies. Come on, sit up straight and tell your neighbor, that's right, amen. Yeah, God ain't got no milky back religious people. He got kingdom citizens full of royal blood. We ain't afraid of nothing. Say amen anyhow. Say amen, Papa. Hallelujah. We can handle stress and come out better. We don't ask God to remove fiery furnace. We say things like, even if he doesn't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it, even if he doesn't. Come on, tell somebody, even if he doesn't. Tell him one more time, even if he doesn't, I'll still be standing. Give him a big shout and a hand clap, brother. Come on, give him praise. We are strong people. Glory, hallelujah. Let me close with this. Crisis is the source of creativity. That's why God allows it. Because you got a lazy brain. God knows that you are more than you are. Write this down. You never grow in good times. History is not a record of good times. <laughs> if you read history, it's 99% crisis. <laughs> we remember not the things you achieved, but the things you endured. That's what we remember about you. Crisis is history. We remember David for what? Goliath. We remember Moses for what? The Red Sea. See, it's the crisis we remember. Why don't you just write some history this time? Use this crisis to show God's power in your life. Let's remember how you came through losing your house. How you came through losing your job. How you came through losing your car. You were still standing. We got tough faith. Oh, I got some good news before I go. Do you know that the that crisis is promised by God. Ecclesiastes 3 says, getting ready to go now. This is important. Everybody read. Verse 1. To everything there is a season and, to, and a time to every purpose in heaven. Read it again. To everything there is a season. Stop right there. To what? Everything there's what? A season. How many things got a season? Everything. Everything only has what? A season. How many things got a season? Everything. I can't hear you. Everything. I still can't hear y'all. How many things got a season? Everything. Everything. Everything only has what? A season. Who promised that? God. This is important. That statement should be enough to take you through the crisis. You missed what he said. You missed it. Everything has what? A season. That means if you are broke now, according to God, that cannot last. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Why can't it last? Because everything only has a season. And if you got a lot of money right now, enjoy it now, brother. Why? That's only a season. That's a promise. That's the part they don't preach on in the charismatic churches. Your marriage is going good right now. That's a season. 
So love hard. Love good while you got it now. Love it, love it, w, 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 w. Love it, love it, love it up. Love it up strong. Why? Because when the test season comes, come on somebody. You need something to hold you through to test together. Because there will be a test season. It's only for a season. You lost your job. Well, sit up straight tonight. Go tell your neighbor, this is only for. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah! Yes, your business ain't doing good right now. And maybe, even, maybe you'll even close it down. But God's going to make you a promise that it's only for a season. That means don't have a funeral. There will be a resurrection. Come on, give God a praise. I say give him a praise, brother. Only for a season. That's the good news. You know what I love about hurricanes? I love hurricanes. See, I discovered how good crises are. A hurricane is a crisis. But a hurricane is a blessing. See, there you are. You charismatic people can't handle that. But when a hurricane is coming, they tell you, it's coming. It'll be here in three days. What do you do? You prepare. How do you prepare? You tie everything down. You don't run from Florida. You tie everything to the rock. Why? Because you know that the hurricane can't stay. Oh, come on, somebody. That's the good news. Everybody say, crisis is always moving. Give God a praise for that. It's only for a season. You know why I love hurricanes? Number one, when they come, they destroy everything that was built uh, against the code. <laughs> if your life ain't built right, the crisis will remove it. We'll see who's built on the rock now. Number two, when a hurricane comes, it destroys trees that looked good on the outside. Tell your neighbor, hope that ain't you. When a crisis comes, it exposes the rottenness on the inside of people's lives you never knew was there. This can happen in the next two years. Thirdly, when a hurricane comes, it removes all pollution. Have you noticed? All of a sudden you get fresh air. The Holy Spirit is watching this crisis clean the church out, clean the air out, clean capitalism out. It's going to wipe everything out that was poison. You know why I like a hurricane? Here's a good one. Because when it's gone, you get new trees. And the real ones are still I want to see you on the other side of the crisis. It's only for a season. Write this down. Everything is seasonal. Say it again. One more time. Keep that in your mind for the rest of your life. And you'll never lose your peace. I know it looks dark right now. But darkness is seasonal. I know it seems cold right now. Oh, you're leaving a... Grammy, thank you for coming tonight. 
I love you, Grammy. I hope my season with you was good. You coming through, Mama. You built good. I can see that. You can come through the crisis. Praise God. Give her a hand. I love the strong women. Glory. Hallelujah. Now, uh, if anybody else leave, I'm just going to go home. Just give me five more minutes. Can you do that? You promise? Because I just want to close on something here. Okay? Write this down. This is a promise. Everybody ready for another promise? Yes. It's a promise that we don't like. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease, God says. As long as what? The earth remains. That means as long as you're on this planet, there will be what? Seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Some of you are in night right now. But look at his promise. The night can't last. What an encouragement. You feel like quitting. When your life fell apart, back then your husband died, you're like, oh God, how am I gonna make God a saying? Just make it through the night, baby. You lost your job right now. Your house is in foreclosure. And God is saying, it's okay. Houses come and go. You remain steady. Let me tell you something. If you lose your house in this crisis, God sent me to tell you this. Listen carefully. You lost that house because that was not your permanent address. God could stop anything he wants to stop. So if he didn't stop it, that was not your permanent address. Give God a praise. If you lost your car, guess what? That was temporary transportation. You should see the one he got coming. Your next house going to blow them away. Don't panic. The day is coming. Hmm. You know, you lost your marriage. And some of you think that's permanent. And God says, no. Day is coming again. Prepare yourself for day. Night ain't supposed to last that long. Weeping may endure only for a night. But there's got to be joy up ahead. What a promise. Here's the one that you never saw before. Daniel 2 verse 20. It says together, Praise be to the name of the Lord God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. What are his? Wisdom and power. Very important words. What is wisdom? Application of knowledge. What is power? Might to make things happen. He has both. Wisdom and power are his. What's the next statement? He changes times. He does what? He changes. Now you see, you keep blaming the CEOs. <laughs> Wall Street, does it? No. It changed times. President, no. He changes times. And what? And seasons. He sets up governments and sets down governments. That's in your constitution. Thank you, Lord. Hold that for me. So stop blaming people and get on with maximizing the crisis. Amen. I'm so excited about what's getting ready to happen in my life. I'm going to maximize this crisis to the glory of God. I'm going to grow 
more. I'm going to experience bigger things. I ain't got time for criticism. I'm too creative for criticism. Because God changes times. God took the entire economy of the world and just shook it. And that's it. Everything that ain't built on him is falling to the ground. And we're in the middle of it. And God called this. This ain't no normal conference, I'm telling you now. This one was set up by God to make sure that everybody here tonight is still standing when the hurricane is over. The greatest protection against change <laughs> this is the kingdom thought is to expect it. Do you know why you're depressed and disappointed? Because number two, the greatest source of disappointment in life is the expectation that things will remain the same. That's why you're depressed. You can never be disappointed in what you expect. That's why he says, to everything. There's a season. Your problem is, you thought everything was forever. Including all the money. All the blessing. Even your health. You will go through physical changes. Who do you think you are? You will not be able to pay some of your bills sometime. You got to taste it. Who do you think you are? You will lose sometime. A winner is simply a loser who kept on trying. Expect it and it will never catch you off guard. Number three, the greatest protection against disappointment is the expectation of change. I tell people all the time, listen, you married now to a beautiful young lady, a handsome young guy, let me, let me give you some advice, okay? This is free. This is free advice. Free advice. Ready? Here it is. If you, if you look at her mother, you will be sleeping with that someday. I know the guy looks good right now, you know. He's pumped. Physique, nice hair, fine guy. Look at his father. That's your future. Bald head, pop belly, teeth gone. That's it. That's, you got to sleep with that for the rest of your life. So don't sit around thinking that he'll always be like, hey, all the, listen, all the weave and the paint can't help. That's the future. Everybody say change. change. Expect it. He said it's only for a season. So the best way to choose a spouse. Y'all are so slow. I'm going to say it again. If you want to get married, the best way to choose a spouse, study the parents. And just say, he look good. I'll take him. If, if, if that's you in the future, I'll take you. That's what you call managing change. Expecting change. Well, I got two things to do before we go, but I'm going to stop right here. Hold that for me. Can I have the glass of water, please? I give you the prophet's reward in Jesus' name. that was upon my life has just come on your family if you give a prophet a glass of water what's on the prophet comes on you okay let me just 
Be prepared to go. We can pick the, we can pick right here tomorrow. We'll miss tomorrow. Okay. Listen to this. The only people that seem to always prosper and thrive in crisis on earth as a culture are the Asians. Have you noticed? You drop a Chinaman anywhere. Just drop it. Boom. Follow me now. I want to show you. I, I, I want to show you the secret to their success. Because they have a kingdom principle they work with. When a Chinaman drops anywhere, when he lands, he lands on his feet. He never looks for a job. Oh, yeah. Y'all are slow. A Chinaman never looks for a job. He looks for a business. So to a Chinaman and to an Asian, a Japanese man, employment is always temporary. Because he thinks in terms of being in charge of his life. Some of the poorest neighborhood in my country, all black people, is a Chinaman in the middle. It's crazy, isn't it? And we're like, what are you doing here? Making money, making money, making money. They have no prejudice. Hello. No prejudice, no racism spirit. Because they never look for a job. That's why I came here to tell you. You can't get fired if you're not hired. Okay. Second reason why they succeed. Here's the big one. Everybody's the perception. In the Chinese language and the Japanese language, there is no word for crisis. In the Japanese and Chinese language, the word that we call crisis is five strokes, and it means opportunity. And we're going to learn this tomorrow. How to interpret crisis. So when a Chinaman house burns down, he says, I have an opportunity, 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 opportunity. Where do you go? Oh my God. Oh, I lost every day. The Chinaman says, opportunity, opportunity. <laughs> Two different mindsets. Chinaman loses his job. He says, thank you, thank you, thank you, opportunity, thank you. You get your pink slip. Oh, Jesus. Oh, the Lord God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, what am I going to do now? The Chinaman says, opportunity, opportunity. Do you know, you will not believe this, do you know that the largest economy in the world is not America, it's Japan. Not even China, Japan. Japan is an island. There's the mystery. Do you know who were bombed with an atom bomb? Japan. Do you know who was obliterated by that powerful weapon, nuclear weapon that wiped out cities? Japan. Do you know who was reduced to rubble and dust? Japan. Do you know who is the greatest competition for export to America? 
Who bombed them? Japan. Because when the bomb landed and there was massive crisis, you had a whole generation shouting. Then they sold you cars. And they sold you TVs. And they sold you stereos. And they bought Sony. And they own Hollywood today. Because in their mind, there's no such thing as a crisis. Close your Bibles. In the kingdom of God, there's no such thing as a crisis. The fiery furnace does exist. The lion's dens do exist. Even when Satan took those nine inch nails, blew them through the risk of Jesus and blood, spread it out all over the Roman soldier's face. 11 inch nails went through his ankles and pierced that wooden tree and blood spilled all over the soldier's hands. Everybody was thinking, crisis. Depends on what you call it. You can call it crisis. Or you can simply call it Christ. <laughs> Opportunity. What man called crucifixion, God used it as a benefit. Called it redemption. That was the most beautiful crisis in history. Let's continue to make it beautiful. Make it through. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.